Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. As many of you know, I, I recently went through a pretty significant tragedy, the death of my girlfriend, whom I loved very much. And one of the pillars of our relationship was the struggle for happiness. Uh, I've done a lot of work on the, the, the subject, so I've come quite a long way toward being a happy person. My girlfriend, um, as of March 12th, which was just you know, within a week or so of her death, actually put a post on Facebook that captured the valiant effort she was putting forth. And it said, and if I messed the quote up, I'm sorry, but it said, people say I look angry. Of course I look angry. My life has been soaked with pain and suffering. It's been a war. But the irony is I'm not angry. I'm just trying to learn to be happy, which is itself a war. The fact that my girlfriend could be thinking about being happy while she was dying of cancer it says a lot to me about her character and about the importance happiness had to her and that it has to me. So I, I think it's an important topic. And so we're going to discuss it tonight with somebody who's well-equipped to do so. She's an objectivist with a master's degree in electrical engineering, a master's in psychology, and she is the president of Thinking Directions, where she teaches managers and others, other professionals how to use targeted thinking to solve problems faster and make better decisions. Jean Maroney, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate your having me. So you're, you're currently doing something called the work of happiness. What does it mean for it to be a work? And I think this is going to capture exactly what my girlfriend was talking about in her, her post on Facebook. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm honored that you're willing to talk about this issue with me because it's a very personal issue and very timely for you. And I do think people sometimes have the idea that happiness is like a garden of Eden. You get to some place and then you're there and then you're happy forever. And that is not what happiness is. There are really unexpected bad things that can happen to you. This came completely out of the blue for you just a couple of months ago, right? Yeah. And that we are not Pollyannas who think that, oh, you just look on the bright side of everything. This is this is a dark time. And it is important to stay value oriented. And it's being value oriented that actually stabilizes your life and lays the foundation to move forward where you can genuinely be happy. So and that takes work. And that is not a set and forget that is something that is ongoing it's part of every day um i mean i would say every hour it is part of the work of life in the same way that uh you know product productiveness is the work of life and relationships don't just happen you actually need to invest <laughs> in them and even hobbies if you you know if you uh, something is not a hobby if you're just passively involved you need to be in you need to be actively pursuing values and that's where all of the joy in life comes from it comes from value oriented effort it's interesting that you say remain val value oriented because when she first got diagnosed she absolutely insisted to me that i continue doing the podcast while she was going through treatments and everything continue posting to social media continue engaging in debates on social media all these are, are things i had very little interest in doing <laughs> you know i love doing podcasts this is my my love but in the context of my girlfriend's health and now death it's not what I wanted to do, but she insisted upon it. She basically told me, you know, we're not going to let this just stop our lives. You have to keep going and, and doing what's necessary. And as I'm doing this now, I it's kind of a tribute to her and to her little boy who whom I promised her I, I would be there for. Now, you mentioned uh, in, in an article I read it's that- Very wise oh, woman, ahead. if I may say. <laughs> yes. Very wise woman, because this is actually helping you deal with this. Yes. This is giving you a purpose in a very difficult time. And that is part of how you stay stable in this time. You so know, it's interesting that you say that, because while I say I have no interest in engaging in debates on social media- uh, on my way home, I, I had about an hour drive from my friend's house, and I noticed that somebody posted something about immigration, something I feel strongly about. I'm very uh, much in favor of, of immigrants. 
And so I responded. And as I engaged in the debate, it was just, I felt comfortable. Like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Even in, in the depths of pain and in despair, it seems like that's, that's my value, pushing the things that I like, promoting them. So I think you're, you're right that she was you know, very wise in, in her insistence. Now, your theory of happiness is derived from the novelist philosopher Ayn Rand. So what uh, most people, I, I would bet, although probably not the listeners to this podcast, but most people probably think, well, what does philosophy you know, epistemology and ethics have to do with happiness. So how is your teachings on happiness derived from her work? It's, 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 it wouldn't be, it wouldn't exist without her work among other things. Well, I think people who wonder about that don't really have her brilliant uh, identification of what morality is. You know, she, she, her, Descript or definition of morality is it's a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. And it's to guide them to achieve, if you're if it's an egoistic morality, which of course hers is, to achieve a fulfilled, happy life here on earth. And if happiness is what you think should be the normal condition of people or should be, you know, is is something to aspire to. You need an egoistic morality because an, an altruistic morality is not consistent with that or a duty morality is not consistent with that. And you need a code of values, a code of moral principles to help you with that. Because basically, one of her other identifications, she has one of her one-liners is, happiness is a state of non-contradictory joy, a joy without uh, conflict or doubt. I believe that's it. I, I should have brought it here to, to with a cheat sheet. And if you are just feeling a temporary pleasure or a temporary joy or a, you know, just a moment of, you know, pride, that's not happiness. Happiness is a more sustained condition. It's a durable state of positive emotion. And you can't get that if you are going in ways that are contradictory to each other. Because it's it's interesting, people think that it should be happiness versus sadness, but the real opposite of happiness is conflict or suffering. Suffering is an experience where you cannot see your way forward everywhere, looks bad. Uh, conflict is where you're being pulled in two directions and if you get this, you don't get this, so whichever way you go, it's lose-lose. That's what the opposite of happiness is, not sadness. Sadness. We'll talk about sadness in a bit because that's obviously very relevant. And the basic cause of suffering is contradictory values. And if you want to have, and that means that like your goals are in contradiction. So like you want to make, you want to, you know, get the promotion at work and spend all your time with your family and you don't see how to do them both. If you don't see how to do them both, you are in conflict and you are suffering and you will wind up sacrificing one or the other. It's actually the work of happiness is figuring out these are two rational goals. How do I figure out the third way where I can get them both in a proper proportion in my life and gain all of my top values? You can't gain every value, but you can gain all your top values at the same time. That's the work of happiness. Now you talked about and, and I think that this is a brilliant point that simply having an abstract code of values isn't enough. Right. We have to identify our concrete values, the actual things in life that we're going to pursue. But you also say that takes a considerable amount of self-knowledge to do so. How do you recommend people go about identifying their values and in, in figuring out where there's contradictions and, and things of that nature? Actually, I have a really simple recommendation for that, which is that you pick a fairly large goal, one that you do think is in your rational self-interest. Like, for example, you have a communication goal with the podcast. You have a career goal with that. Uh, usually it is a career goal. It does not have to be a career goal. But take a fairly significant goal, something that's a, at least, say, six months or a year, and start pursuing it. And what will happen is if you wind up in conflict 
in relation to pursuing this goal. The conflict is some other value that appears to be incompatible with it. And that is now your moment to get clear on that other value, both of these values. What are they? Like, like I mean, do you want to take the uh, work home case? Sure. Right. So, I mean, it's a little bit abstract. It's always easier to work with real concretes. But if, a, a, like, say, I, I just took a week, not a whole week, but in the end, it's a week off to go help my sister who was injured. And I actually spent a few days with her uh, because she she broke her arm and she actually couldn't do a whole bunch of things for herself. And I went and stayed with her for a few days. And during that time, I didn't do any work on my book. Now, if that were a month, that would be a problem, right? In, in the sense that my book is my top productive value. But in the context of I've been working on it continuously and this is an emergency situation and she's very important to me. I didn't, I did actually plan it for when we could do it. Some cousins helped her for a little while. And then I came in after a certain amount of days, I planned it. So when I could work it around my work, um, because she did have some other assistance, but I figured out how I could have both. And I figured out how much time I could spend and figured out how I could support her in that. And I did that in the context of a real situation of a real clarity about what I wanted to do for her about what would be helpful for her and also a context of, of where the book is. That feels a little artificial for this example, but my point is that it's a real issue that you face and in, in figuring out the concretes, concretes have all the details. There's no way if my sister, my cousins took her in right after she had her accident. And if they hadn't, I would have been on a plane the next day. I couldn't get there. I physically couldn't get there that night because you can't get there that fast. <laughs> but I would have been on the plane the next day if they hadn't taken her in. But uh, because it was an emergency. But it's always in a concrete that you figure these things out and you can figure out what are my priorities and you can actually answer questions like, well, why does this person matter to me? Like this, um, what is the name of the the child that you are... Uh, now, Vinny. Godfather of what's his name? Vincenzo or Vinny? Vinny. Vinny. Okay, yeah. great. Right. So Vinny has a big place in your life. Yeah. Right. Sure. And I, uh, it, it's like in um, there's a book by Adele Faber, Elaine Maslers, and Adele Faber called uh, "Siblings Without Rivalry." And one of the things they talk about is you don't give equal time to each of your children. Your children need different things at different times. And it's the same thing with your values. Your values need different things at different times. And the key is to make sure you hold the context of all your values. So at any given time, you're actually figuring out which one needs the most at this time. And that's a real decision. That's not a theoretical decision. That's based on the situation on the ground. You know, Something that's always helped me when it comes to identifying my actual values is I have basically a two prong test. Watch what I actually do, how I actually behave. I mean, if I'm saying that I value my health and I'm stuffing my face with ring dings <laughs> in, in you who every day, then my claim is just BS. Also, I, to watch my emotional reactions to things. Now, just because I have a, a concrete value, you know, if if something's taken away from me, my cup or my microphone, whatever, it doesn't mean that I should value that thing, but it will tell me what I actually value. You, you yes. know what I mean? Yes. Now, Can I say something on oh, that? Absolutely. Second? Yeah, sure. Right. Because there's uh, the reason that you can even have value conflicts is that sometimes you conclude values intellectually, like you you read about this like integrity, I can tell is a big value to you because you have emotions when you say you value health and then you eat ring dings or whatever it was, right? Yodels, whatever brand. <laughs> they're all good. <laughs> they're all delicious. Tastes good anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, um, and that's, that is your intellectual conclusion that integrity is a value and that you should be loyal, loyal, in, loyal to, to your convictions and values bringing up that, hey, these two things seem to be somewhat in conflict, and then you get concerned about that, right? 
And that is the reason that I recommend pursuing a goal because that is going to bring up the conflict of anything that is in conflict. That's how you actually integrate them. You take a big goal and you find out what is in a problem with the big goal and you solve it as you go. The only reason I don't, I mean, I do think ultimately you do the introspection you're talking about and the observation of your actions. Monitoring is the observation of your actions and introspection is the identification of your emotions and noticing what is causing emotions. That the only reason I added the pursuing the goal is that's the thing that helps you integrate it. Otherwise, some people just sit kind of in a, in, you know, sit back, look at um, looking at their emotions and they spend all their time introspecting. And that will not reorganize your value hierarchy. That will not resolve the contradictions. You can't do it at your desk. You need to do it in action. Right. Otherwise, you just have these things floating around your your head. Right. It, it's, it sounds similar to like journaling. When you journal things, you can organize it. It's not just all floating in space, basically. Yes. Something that you, you wrote reminded me of an essay that Ayn Rand wrote, and it, it brought a, a dynamic that I've seen or it seems to me is occurring with a lot of objectivists or, you know, followers of Ayn Rand. The essay is The Cult of Moral Grayness. Mm -hmm. And in it, she was addressing the fact that many people claim there's no such thing as black and white. There's only gray. And I think she's absolutely correct about that. The I think a lot of objectivists make the opposite error mm -hmm. and they assume everything is black and white. There is no area of gray. That's been my experience anyways. How does that affect one's ability to be happy when it, like they, they think you have to either have this value or that value. Like you talked about the home and work, right? And right. They, and somebody might say, well, it's either you devote everything to work or you devote everything to home. When the reality is you need to figure out the balance and how to achieve both values. Right. Well, I think that part of the key here is to think in terms of color instead of gray. So I actually would, I actually would agree. I, I would, I would go against gray because gray is got black in it, right? Yeah. But there are a lot of primary colors that don't have black in them. That's true. And that's the way to think about your values is that, and that you can have a palette of colors and you get to choose the palette. And it's also true that the canvas is this big. And if and that there's work to do to make it be a beautiful canvas. It needs, if it's not integrated, it's not gonna be a beautiful canvas. So the way that I would look at it is this way. It, there is a black, the black and white part only refers to, is this a value in principle? Like, can you philosophically say that a job, you know, of some kind of productive, some kind of work that in fact creates values is rational? Yes. And you can, and there are million. I mean, I don't know if there are millions. There must be millions because there are billions yeah. of people. Millions of different jobs all of which are completely rational per se, right? In principle. And, you know, is it rational in principle to have romantic relationships and family relationships? Yes, it is rational in principle. Is it rational in principle to have hobbies? Absolutely. You know, so all of these things are rational in principle. That is the part, that's all that philosophy can tell you. If you only go by philosophy, then you have you know, there's a million things that you could do. And how do you decide what you're going to do right now? Well, you need to have concrete values. And there you definitely need to make decisions. And you need to see them as decisions between good, better, best, as opposed to good and bad. Because there are many people you can spend time with. And, you know, there's there are nice people. There are decent people. There are, you know, you don't want to spend, you know, you're going to chick choose people who share your values in some way, but spend most of your time with the people who share your values the most. It's a prioritization problem, not a either or problem. And I do think what, what I think you're getting at, which I wouldn't say it's the problem of being black and white. It's the problem of being either or, which is not exactly the same thing, but it's getting at what you're, I think, do you agree that gets at the I, same thing? I've always you're, thought of them as the same thing. Like the, when you, so when, when I studied cognitive behavioral therapy and they show the thinking error of either or, I, that's what I think of black and white, but I, I'm certainly open to them being conceptually different, but yes, you're right. That's how I'm thinking of it. 
Right. And so the reason that I'm making a distinction here is because I do think it's important to be very clear on the difference between good and evil. And the, but the, but there's so many possibilities in the good, so many possibilities in the good. Right. And there you get into a lot of trouble if you think of it in terms of either or. Usually when you get stuck in either or between work and uh, home or this friend or that friend or whatever, you're not being creative enough. And what can happen is you start looking at only the bad things that happen if you don't do this or you don't do this. You start looking at it in terms of the bad parts. And that's what actually gives you tunnel vision. If you start looking in at what you want, if you start looking in, well, like, what is the value I get from, say, this promotion at work or this, um, why do I want this job? Why do I want this? And, and understand that more deeply, you can usually find an alternative path to that that is more compatible with, say, why do I want to spend time with my family? And so it's only by thinking a little more abstractly about your values. We really need an actual example for this because it's I can tell it's floating. Um, that you can find the third way that comes from being value oriented. There's always a third way, but you need to be in a value oriented mindset to get creative and figure out what it is. And if you are of the opinion that everything is black and white or everything is either or either one of those things, that's going to cause problems. I think I might have a concrete example for this that, that we're we'll talking about. So a few months ago, my girlfriend was living with her son and she was living in a, in a house where she was paying rent mm -hmm. and she found out that the owner was going to sell the house. So we needed to figure out how we're going to do it. She Now, if we looked at it in black and white or in either or term, she can either go to work or take care of her son. How can she do that? You, 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 she had to take care of her son. She didn't have enough money for daycare. Then there was the idea, well, maybe I could babysit him. I could take care of him, but then I'm going to be losing out on my podcast. So what we ultimately figured out and what we did was I moved in with her. She was able to go to work every day. I took care of her son and I was able to do my podcast at the same time. So by being creative, we right. solved every issue where we had, we had money coming into the house. We had her son taken care of, but my priorities and my values weren't being neglected because I was still right. able to do the podcast. Is that, does that sort of fit the, what you're talking about? That's a great about? example, right? When you first analyze it, it seems like it's only bad options. And then when you say, well, the big three things are care for the sun, keep the money coming in, keep the podcast going. Yeah. Then you start to say, oh, well, actually, if Michael lived here, this could all be done at once. Yes. And, and then that's what we did. I have yes. a, a question for you about my own. Now I'm, it's very raw for me. My emotions are raw, yeah. you know, so, it, and there's all types of conflicts that I know need to be processed, integrated and go forward. But my girlfriend and I had a, um, I don't want to say a conflict. She had had a really hard life as did I, but I had worked on overcoming it a lot longer than she did. And like, she would do her culinary school. She was taking cooking, you know, uh, lessons to become a chef. And over and over again, she would tell me, I can't do this. It, this, this lesson is too hard. And I would tell her, honey, every time you thought you couldn't do it, you ended up doing it and getting a hundred. So you can do it. And I would always try to demonstrate, like if we, you know, we didn't have a car and we were out of milk and she said, and it was in the winter time. And she says, well, what are we going to do? We have no milk And the store is a mile, mile and a half away. I said, I'll walk and get it. It's not a big obstacle to overcome. I can do that. We need whatever we need. And, and over and over again, I just tried to demonstrate that obstacles in life are meant to overcome. And when she got the cancer, all of the sudden, everything that I had tried to show her like, mm. evaporated because now there was nothing I could do. I couldn't say, honey, I can just go do this. She fought as valiantly as any human being I I've ever seen in my life. But there's this sense that I have, and it's only like a, a vague emotional sense that my worldview of everything being overcome was not vindicated, that her pessimism was vindicated because in the end, the example came that we couldn't overcome. First of all, is that a natural part of the sort of a, a grief process? And secondly, how do I or anybody watching that struggles with a similar thing, move on to get back to the optimistic frame of the, the I'm going to pursue values frame. 
So the first thing I want to say, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, the answer to the first question, this is a completely understandable world shaking event for you, right? This is, this is, it's a tragedy and it, it it's, it's shaking you up, which is completely understandable. So let me say the piece I wanted to say about mourning right now, because I think that's really important okay. because, you know, we're not trying to get you to happy right now, Michael. You don't, you don't get to happy when you're in the middle of mourning the loss of your girlfriend. I mean, you'll probably have moments of humor and moments of joy and things like that. But what you're trying to get to is serenity. Serenity is, it's, it's not suffering. It's not happiness either. It's, it's, a, it's a calm state. It's a transitional state. But it's a state where you can pause and get your breath. And that's really what I think the mourning process is to get you from anger and despair and frustration and guilt, whatever emotions you're having, to get them settled down to, in effect, a peacefulness. That's where the sadness comes in. That's when you're really able to feel the sadness. And tell me one thing that you loved about your girlfriend tell me one thing i want to show you how this works her tenacity was just a, uh, and i'll give you a concrete example yes. of, of her determination and independence and they all flow we recently had a snowstorm we had a few of them mm -hmm. actually and i knew when i woke up at six o'clock in the morning i was going to have to shovel multiple times during the day there was no way i was going to wait till three it, it would have been too much so i got up i went out and shoveled and, and she was already not feeling well, not horrible, but, you know, she was a little weak and thought she had a cold right. and we did have COVID. So there's that. But so I went, I went outside, I shoveled the snow, I went back to sleep an hour and a half or so later, I hear this scraping and I'm like, what the hell is that noise? And I look out the window and my 93 pound sick girlfriend is out there shoveling. And I go, and I'm, I'm like, Part of me was infuriated by it. And there were times during her illness that this aggravated the hell out of me because I'm like, you have to sit still. You can't just keep wanting to work all the time. But it's who she was. And right. I went to, I said, what the hell are you doing? I was going to do that. And she said, I'm capable of doing it. Mm. And, and I absolutely love that about her, that even though she suffered with insecurities and trying to overcome them, in the end, she always did it. Like she had an an issue with her teeth and she was very insecure about it. And she had to have them all removed and she got dentures. And what she did was she smiled wide, took a picture and posted it to Facebook because it was her way of, this is my journey. This is my new smile. Here I am. She, she had a strength. I can really yeah. hear she had a strength. Yes. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I admired the hell out of it. What she put her little body through in terms of biopsies and, and surgeries and, and just everything in the last month and a half, all to the goal of being there for her little boy is just a courage and a strength that I don't think I would have in that, that situation. I think I would just say, screw this. Like this isn't even worth it, but I don't have, you know, I don't have children. She had that son right. and it was just an amazing thing to watch. And I, you know, I, I, this is actually going to contradict the question that I'm going to ask you later, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to take that with me the rest of my life, that lesson yeah. of just the yep. strength in, in such she dire was. circumstances. So that's what, I guess it's not one thing that, that I yeah, No, but this is, but yeah. Th this is the process of mourning, Michael. You take something, well, actually it can start from anything. It could be you, that you were angry at her, but this is something you loved and this is the best place to start. And you think about it and you really get clear on why you loved it why you love her for it and what it means to you. And you also did the other part, which is you're gonna take this as a symbol of strength that you probably would be stronger another time. You would fight harder another time because you saw what she was willing to do. Am I right about that? Yeah, and in, when you said the stronger part, you know, I was in prison and I, that's, I've known her before I went to prison, but that's a long time ago. But we were writing back and forth and we were on the phone and she was really stressed out. Really, but I have OCD and I was in an obsessive loop that I needed to be able to address and talk about. And I said to her, I said, honey, listen, 90% of the time, I'll always have the strength to make it through. There's, But that 10%, I'm going to need you to be strong. Right now I'm obsessing and it's rough. 
and the obsession I had was what if I don't love Melissa? And I, when I had to be honest with her and I had to explain to her, it's just OCD. These obsessions aren't real. So I didn't want her to fear what I was telling her, but I wanted to be honest and help her to understand. And the second I said to her, I need you to be strong. She got herself together. She said, okay, go. And she just toughened up immediately, listened to me vent and cry over the telephone. The next time I called her, she had done a massive amount of research on OCD. She said, okay, this is what's happening. No, you're right. It's not real. And it, that's just who she was. And it's like, I mean, how could I not admire her? <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And tell me something. So this is, so this is, this is a wise woman. This is a strong woman. This is a woman who gave you support at a really difficult time in your life. Yes. And that you gave support back to at a very difficult time in her life. One of the parts of mourning is to get really clear on that. This is my, I am hearing that this was an important part of your relationship with her. That strength together was an important part of your relationship. Yes. Am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That is something she was, she was an irreplaceable value. She is irreplaceable, but strength in a relationship is something you can get with some of the other people in your life. It won't be the same as her, but if you can see it in those abstract terms and say, yeah, this matters to me. One, you've already said part of it. I I am never going to forget that. This is a, something I'm going to take with me for the rest of my life. That's an irreplaceable value that you've gained by having her in your life. Two, this is something I want in my future relationships. This is something I'm going to look for. This matters to me. This was, I am not going to live my life without this kind of strength in me and in the people around me. This is how you mourn by identifying the values, by identifying how important she was, by identifying why you care, how it changed you, how you're going to keep it with you, and how you're going to you're going to find another way to get this in your life, not today, not next week. But your life, this is this is important to you. And it's by identifying that it's important to you that you can commit to having this in your life in some way. Maybe it will show up in your relationship with Vinny. It could very well be that you decide that you want to show that to him and teach that to him so that he will know his mother. I'm just making that up. I don't know if that's at all right, Michael. No, it's 100%. I actually made a commitment to her that I will never let that little boy, and, and thankfully his father likes me, we get along well and I'm going to be in his life, but I never will let him forget how much his mother loved him and right. what she was willing to do for him. Right. What she was willing. Cause I, I told when, when, when she was first sick, you know, it's hard to find words because I was suffering too. And I was scared, right. but I had no clue what she was going through because you had the fear compounded by the pain and, and everything else. But I, I told her and when we were talking, I said, you know, there's going to come in time in Vinny's life. I said, I can't promise you that fighting is going to help you live. This is a monster, this illness. Mm -hmm. But at some point, he can either be told his mother did everything for him mm -hmm. or she didn't. And in the end, she was just, a, <laughs> it was, it, she actually, I, I said to her one time we were talking and she was aggravated with the doctors. And I said to her, and it was a serious question. I wasn't like trying to be an asshole. If somebody wants to to go during those times and not fight it, that's understandable. And I said to her, honey, do you want to live? And she hit me. <laughs> and I was so happy she did because it was that ferocity, that strength. Like, yeah. how dare you ask me that question? You know what I mean? And it was just yeah. great. And that's now that I can convey that right. to Vinny. And you hear how you are honoring her this pro this is a process both celebration and mourning are a process of honoring values and that's what you're doing you're celebrating her life you're mourning the loss and you do it by getting clear on the values sharing the values thinking about how they are part of your life thinking about how you're going to keep them be a part of your life you see this is i mean how do you feel right now michael 
Right now, uh, to be honest, I actually feel pretty good. Now, the, yes. the, it comes and goes in, in ways. Yes, of course it does. You know, but right now- That's I, because I, I you've been good. honoring her. That's yes. because you've been honoring her. This is this is the process to get, when you're in the worst part of it, when you start thinking about, uh, uh, we'll talk about a worst case, but the thinking about her values and what you care and how they're important to you, that will put you back. It'll put you at least to a state of serenity. And it can put you into a state of, you know, some kind of, uh, happiness is not quite the right word, but a positive state. This is not a coincidence. And that's why this is the work of mourning. It's going to take you time, right? I mean, when you lose a spouse, it takes a year by all accounts. Uh, someone who's been, you know, in your life so much because there's so many values to process. But this is what gets you out of the suffering and into a better state. And I interrupted yeah. you. I no, no, it's fine. No, no, it's good. It, it, it's great. Um, there's... You talked about seeing value in horrible situations. And I've, for a very long time, have said to myself, every situation I want to learn from. So in 2008, while I, while I was incarcerated, my mother committed suicide. And I said, what can I take from this? And I said, you know what? I'm living. I never thought that my biggest fear my entire life was losing my mother. It led to so many insecurities and problems with relationships and everything else. And when my mother did that, I said to myself, you know what? I've just suffered the ultimate abandonment, the ultimate loss, and I'm okay. And I said, I can take that. I can take anything. But it turns out that wasn't the ultimate loss because it doesn't even approach the pain I feel for this. Mm -hmm. Now, in this situation, I can see lessons all out in front of me that, that I can take. And that's why I said I'm going to contradict myself later. Because, yes, <laughs> right? But it's almost like I don't want to grab them. It, it, I, I feel like I'm just one of them is in this one. I've, I'm already starting to assimilate is that within two weeks of talking to her on the phone and writing letters, I knew I loved her. There was no doubt in my mind, but that was so uh, different from what I thought love was and what it, what it needed to come about that. I'm like, this can't be like, what am I doing? This can't be real. But I called her up and told her. And right now I am so glad that I didn't wait and say, well, let me see how this pans out and we'll wait a few months. Like how much would I have missed had I not just followed my value, followed my love and, and told her how I felt. So that's one lesson. So I guess I am already taking lessons, but there's also yeah. lessons that I don't want. Yeah. How do I put it? Like, I yeah, don't want to, I don't, I don't want to process it right now. Like, I don't want to say, okay, there's a lesson. Let me process it, integrate it, grow. It's similar to the idea. Like I'm thinking if I'm ever happy again, or if I'm not in pain and I know this isn't true, but I have the feeling that it would be betraying my love for her. Like I would be diminishing it. If I'm not in absolute pain, it would dim diminish the love I have for her, which is actually strange because that's not what she would want. She, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a mess, basically. I don't know how else so, to describe it. Right. So, and, and I just want to, I just want to caution everybody, right? I'm not a therapist, but I have some suggestions for you, Michael. And, and it's not, you have to go learn all the lessons and it's not, you need to now get yourself in a positive mood because some of the things are going to be more pain. You know, when you start thinking about them, you're, they're first going to be more painful, Right. Uh, now, and I don't want to, I don't think we should do therapy on the air, right? So I don't, I'm not saying we should bring one up, but like, let's take this thing that you just said, that part of you feels like if you're not suffering, you're not honoring her. It's completely fine for you to have a thought like that and for you to sit with that. And what I would recommend is actually do some journaling on all about that, not trying to argue with it on at some level, you think it doesn't make sense. But what you want to do first is you want to actually find out where that comes from and find the values that are involved there. And I bet there are things like values of loyalty. And um, there are probably also some other things like things that you and she had planned to do together that you're not going to be able to do together. 
that you need to actually think about and actually process that loss and why did you want to do it and what does it mean now that you can't? And it's not the case that all of mourning immediately gets you to start getting excited about bragging, bragging on your girlfriend, which is a great thing to do, right? Part of it is going to be more internal and, but still in journaling and you're going to cry while you do it. But I have to say crying is really different from being in conflict, right? Sadness is, uh, it's a cleansing experience and it's another way of honoring the value. Like Again, I'm I'm hesitant to here. I'm hesitant to bring in a concrete because I think it might make it too raw for you. But um, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Bring it up. I um, I've lived my, my it's since I decided to become a better human being. I've lived my life as face everything, regardless of what it is, and that's the best way to deal with it. So if you've got a good concrete, share it. Well, it's fine. Uh, so. So let me say something about that. There's facing things and there's also taking care of yourself while you're facing them, right? Well, that's true, yeah. And the and it the you do need to face everything. That's I mean that's something you're a, you're a master of and you get full credit for that. And sometimes you need to be gentle with yourself about that and say, "Gee, this is really painful." Like the other thing that you just you brought up a few minutes ago about feeling like her pessimism got validated in your you know, that you can solve every problem somehow got invalidated. And that's, that could be really earth shattering. And um, you need to kind of sit with that. And that's going to take some sorting out, Michael. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I'm going to just make a, I'm going to make a speculation here. Okay. Which, which you can, you know, you'll tell us if it's too raw, you not say, you'll say so. If it's off, you'll say so. If you okay. don't, if you want to just use it as a theoretical example, you'll say so. Like one of the things I hear from your story is that it mattered to you that you could solve her problems, that that was something that you took personal pride in, that when she had something she didn't know how to solve, that was part of what you you relied on your creativity and your can-do spirit that you could help solve that. And that mattered to you. Um, I wouldn't put it quite that way, but you're, you're close. It wasn't that I could do it. It was that the problem is solvable. Right. It, it wasn't necessarily like, watch, I'll fix it. It was just right. that for, and I still believe this, that for most problems that come about, there's a solution. It's not the end of the world for me to walk down to the store and get milk was like, who cares? It, it took me in a, right. you know, an hour I was back and we had our milk. Right. It was about, cause a lot of the time it was her, like when she was doing her schoolwork, uh, the cooking something, I'm never going to get this done. I've got my son, he's crying. I can't do it. Honey, you can do it. Yeah. Believe right. me, you can do it. You've done it every time. Right. And, and, and she did. So it, it it, it was important to me that she knew that values were achievable, that problems were capable of being solved, overcome, and moving forward. And she was at the point, I think, or close to where logically she understood that. But, you know, the emotional apparatus doesn't catch up to, to your logical conclusions right. just because you've learned something. It takes time for the two to integrate. And then, you know, what was I going to say to her What when she had cancer? Honey, right. it's solvable. You can do it. Because it, ultimately, it's not. The right. best case scenario I was looking up was five years. Right. And, and what I told her was, okay, if we can get that, maybe they'll come up with a new treatment, which is very uh, possible. I told her, look, I don't know. I can't predict the future, but it's possible. It's just that cancer is just so like, right. There's no, there, there's as little guarantee you're going to overcome that as there is anything in the world. Right. And it's, it comes with, this is again, a philosophical point, right? Which is you, you morality, good choices, rationality, doing your best does not guarantee success. No. And this is a great example where, Part of accepting reality here is 
that she had to fight even to try to get five years and she actually wasn't able to do that. I mean, she, I mean, she fought, but yeah. the doctors were not able no, in her particular too, case. Yeah. It was just too much. It was, it was too far gone. Yeah. yeah. So, so this gets to another aspect of serenity that I think is important is the accepting reality part. And you need to be able to both accept reality and pursue your values. It sounds to me like that's what she did. She accepted reality that was, she had a very slim chance of survival. And that to get that slim chance, she had to undergo a whole bunch of painful tests and procedures. And she decided she was fighting for it. Yes, she did. Right. And, you know, Ayn Rand's line actually is appropriate here. Those who fight for the future live in it today. She was living her values. She was in touch with her values. She was, I'm sure it was painful. I'm sure it was terrible. But she was alive. She didn't just give up and, you know, turn over and, you know, no. stop. Right. And that is that is the thing that is always, fighting for your values is always open for you. Gaining the values depends on some external circumstances that are not always under your control. The part that's under your control is accepting reality when it becomes clear. That's another part of serenity. I mean, the, I mean, you see this sometimes with people who lose someone who really will not accept that they're gone or will not accept that, you know, that there wasn't anything that they can do about it or something about that. And what happens is that they stay in suffering. They stay suffering. They stay fighting that fact. And that puts them into suffering and that elongates the mourning process. Or what some of them do is they decide they just can't deal with it. It's too painful. And that, you know, that actually what, actually that's a different thing. That actually cuts all those values out of their lives. It's like they can't do anything that was associated with that person and those values because then they start to feel painful again and they don't want to feel that. Well, no, you do not want to lose all these values from your life that you had with this woman. Those are your values. And as part of fighting for your values, you're both going to accept facts and find ways to fight for those values here on earth as you go forward. And it doesn't mean that success is guaranteed, but it does mean that you will have the joy in living in effect. And, you know, a lot of times we say, well, you can you know, deal with any obstacle. Well, sometimes the way you deal with an obstacle is you decide, yeah, that's actually not my top priority right now. I'm going over here instead, right? And part of accepting reality is, is accepting what are your priorities? Your priorities shifted instantly when you lost her. And part of what this mourning process is, is figuring out what are your values and how are you moving forward here? And that's, that is something you can do. So you can always prioritize. You can always fight for your values. You can always accept reality. Those three things you always can do. You, you know, don't always get what you wanted though. No, it's it's interesting to me because I've taught that lesson. I used to teach nonviolence techniques in, in prison and guys mm -hmm. would say, oh, but what if a guy does this? And, what? and I would tell them, listen, nothing is guaranteed to work. I right. said, you can eat right, exercise, do everything you're supposed to and die of a heart attack at 45. Yes, you can. It's about what is going to give you the best chance of success. Yeah. And what, what I find interesting is in this case, like I, it, the human mind is an amazing thing. Under all the stress, I'm not seeing the very principle that I've taught so much that you just pointed out, that you just accept reality. That having an, an optimistic orientation doesn't mean that you think that everything is possible at all times. It just means that with effort, you greatly increase your chance of succeeding at whatever you're trying to accomplish. And it means that, and I would put it in, I, I, I agree with that's the practical argument, which I totally agree with. And I'm going to make the moral argument. This is the, this is what integrity is. Right. This is loyalty in action to your convictions and values. And your values have your your deeper values, the, the deeper values that she represented to you 
have not changed, right? Uh, and part of what happens, this happened, this happened when my mother died. I discovered things that, you know, because there was a hole in my life, right? And in the process of mourning her, I discovered things that I had taken completely for granted that I that mattered to me very much. That she had been, in effect, having her in my life, I had gained certain kind of value that I didn't realize. And it's actually, it's like a family type value that I just took for granted because of the way my mother was, as a certain kind of social dealing with people. And I needed to learn that by losing her and then find ways to bring that back in my life with you know the the people who were my friends and and uh and and the loved ones who are still here and you sometimes find those things out by the that you know concretes are complex a person is so complex and your relationship has so many facets a lot of those values are implicit and that's part of what the mourning process does is you get to get even clearer on all the reasons you loved her and how she helped your life. And you get to, by being clearer, you get to find other ways to gain those. And the thing is, is that value for me back to, you know, to get to working on happiness, that mm -hmm. all the work that I had put in yes. up, up till the point when she wrote to me, put me in a position where I was ready for an adult, mature, conflict, you know, I don't want to say conflict-free because all relationships have conflicts, but it wasn't a conflict-ridden relationship. It wasn't right. constant. And it put me in a position to where I was happy with her. I did achieve that happiness. The, by working, I was able to be happy and I'll always have happy memories with her. Right. And, and, you know, and I've said this before, I don't regret it for a second, like I would do it again and suffer this over and over again to have that happiness. A few weeks ago, she said to me, honey, I'm sorry that I wrote to you because she felt so bad about what I was going through. And I said, not for a second, not for a second. No way. I, <laughs> that love was amazing to me. I mean, the, the happiness that I had both inside of prison and outside of prison, this has been a phenomenal ride. And it right. sucks and it's horrible and I'm in tremendous pain, but so what? I, I, so what when compared to the happiness and to the future but, happiness I'll have with, you know, her son that, that is now going to be a part of my life and I absolutely adore him. So mm -hmm. there's still going to be plenty of joy and memories and you know, practical just spending time with Vinny. So it's all worth it. And that to me is, I guess, maybe the work of happiness when it as applies to this situation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I really commend you've done a lot of work already in a short period of time. I commend you, Michael. Thank you so much. Really uh, before I let you go, is there anything else that we need to address as pertains to the, well, the subject? Do you mind if I make a plug for this? No, I hope you do. <laughs> okay. Right. So one of the reasons um, Michael and I talked about my coming back on the show was that I'm actually starting a series on the work of happiness in the Thinking Lab, which is my membership program. And you can read about it at thinkingdirections.com. There's a description that it's gonna be, the way I do these classes, I do these series. And so there are two classes a month. And the first three are gonna be sort of theoretical. I've, I've written a lot on happiness on my blog, and we're gonna be talking about those and really getting everybody's head around what this happiness is, some of the things we were talking about tonight. And then starting uh, mid-May, we're going to be practical and people are going to be doing daily thought work. They don't have to do it, but there's going to be an exercise to do about two weeks or three weeks at a time um, that can really help you. There's different kinds of thought work you need at different times in your life. And I'm going to be teaching each of the tactics that can work as a daily thought work. And that's going to last through the rest of the summer. So I think it's going to be a really wonderful uh course. I think it's going to raise the baseline level of happiness of a, a lot of thinking labbers. Good. And I want to invite people maybe to join me. I think it would be. Well, I, I, I hope they do. As you can see, Jean knows what she's talking about. I encourage everybody to check it out. Uh, also, um, speaking of the little boy, Vinny, uh, there, I'm going to attach to this a link that his aunt set up a GoFundMe page for his future. He's a five-year-old autistic boy. He's absolutely beautiful. 
Um, and if you'd like to help them out with even a you know a quarter, 50 cents, dollar, whatever, everything helps. Thank you, Gene. Thank, Thank you, Mike. In the audience, you, you, it, this is just a, a wonderful experience for me. For now, this is the Rational Legalist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.